All right. Well, good morning and welcome once again to the hour of depression. Here we are. Just look at the faces. Here's your sign. <laughs> Amen. All right. Come on, cut the hair. Let's go. Cut it off. She shouldn't have started that. Move it. Uh, some things can't be improved upon. <laughs> All right. Uh, Russ, Pat Patricia, that is James and your name, ma'am? <laughs> and Kathy, that's the Bradshaws. They, till they moved to Union, they were pretty regular. Amen. Now they're regular. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Union's a little bit of a drive. You know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but I'm worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Brother Dave, if you would, open us in a word of prayer. Amen. Oh, Lord God, we say the Lord again. We do thank you for this day, Lord God. We do thank you for, uh, again, for fun, uh, Sunday school class, Lord, and Father, and uh, Father, and uh, what uh, Brother Dale's bringing. And Lord God, uh, we do thank you, Lord, for each and every one that's here, Lord. And, Father, we do pray for the ones that uh, are not here, that want to be here, Lord God, that we have some sick and some with ailments, and uh, Father, some healing has got to be done, Lord, before they get back, and Lord God, I do pray, Lord, that uh, you touch each and every one of them, Lord, and help them, Lord, and lift them up, Lord God, get them healed up, get them back in the house of the Lord, and many others are coming, Lord, I, I pray you give them travel mercies. Get them here safe and whole, Lord. And Father, we're looking to hear from you, from the Word of God, that you have the uh, pastor anointed, Lord, that uh, you got him, that he's prayed up, ready, studied up, Lord God, to give us what you'd have us to have, Lord God, to help us, strengthen us, carry us through these these vile and wicked days that we're in. And we'll thank you and praise you in the Lord Jesus Christ's name we can pray. Amen. Amen. Are we having a guest preacher? <coughs> He said one about being prayed up and studied up. <laughs> anyway. All right. Brother Timbo. Already. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Everybody. Remember the excitement in the room. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Remember it's the hour of depression. All right. <laughs> Good morning, Concord Baptist Church. Please stand turn to page one twenty six. Rock of Ages. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and we was coming back through Anderson, and we saw the Walmart there, and I said, ah, Megan, you want to visit your biological mother? And she said, yeah, we'll get to you, since you got to see her this weekend. Anybody? Yeah. She divorced Michael, and now she's, uh, she's got another guy. She's dumping him because she met another guy. <coughs> Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is made unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy Meta will be showered all around. Brethren, see for sinners round you stumbling on the brink of woe. Death is coming, hell is moving, can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray and holy men will be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? Moses' sister hated him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior. Tell them that he will be found. Sisters, pray and holy men will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven and his table will sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. Good to see Richard and his lovely wife and children. Amen. Amen. What a pleasant surprise. I've seen her one time since they got married. That was at the shop and never did get a chance to talk to her. Amen. Honeymoon's still on, isn't it? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah, you're an exception. Amen. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it was kind of funny. I take the back roads back from Tacoa Friday because, uh, my goodness, I I hate Interstate 85. That's the most dangerous highway. I hate it when I ran trucks. But uh took the back way, and I come by. I said, Anderson. Ah, oh, Walmart. Ah, oh, Megan's mom. So I went past it. I said, you want to go back and see if she's there? Yeah. So she got to see her mom again, amen. We try to keep them around, some of them, that see them once in a while. It's been five years, I think, since she saw her. Yeah. And their biological dad, he he got out of prison and remarried. He's got another family out in Oklahoma. But her, his parents live in Florida. And so just about every year they come through and we meet for dinner and, you know, and they give the kids gifts and stuff, so. You know, they have a, a little connection to their roots, amen? 
And I think that part's good. So, But anyway, you want to go back? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without Megan. Probably retire and have peace. I don't know. Just joking. <laughs> Megan's a big help to me. Jasmine, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she got accepted at Midlands and and I'm a IT. Big, I'm a big help with you wasting your money. Yeah. <laughs> she is that. I don't know. There ain't no lie. Amen. <laughs> All right. Titus chapter 3. We want to look at the doctrine of regeneration. Regeneration. Pray for us here, Brother Tommy. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us, done for us. And Lord, I thank you for the people we got to make it here today, Lord. Thank you for the visitors. And Lord, I just now pray that you'll, you'll give the pastor what you'll have us to have and regeneration, Lord, and just fill us, Lord. And uh, Lord, I'll just be sure to give you all the praise, honor, and we're going to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray and ask his time. Amen. Amen. Titus in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Let me stop here for just a moment. It says to speak evil of no man. I had a fellow that was through here he was a con man amen and uh, he was a good con man I mean everywhere he went he got somebody real good and uh, when I first met him he's the one that believe it or not got us started in the printing ministry and we gave him five thousand dollars for one of them Rizzo graphs like we got in the office and uh, then he got into my computers and then my computer Denver came back and anyway I drove to Cincinnati I flew up there once and drove up there twice even to see him but uh anyway he ended up back down in Kentucky he uh got a girl in trouble there in the church uh went to work for a man he's a great electrician great electrician great printer and uh Anyway, he'd come down here with two service trucks loaded with electrical equipment to work. And I uh, found out later all the stuff that he was selling off that he couldn't carry with him belonged to the guy that he worked for. <laughs> and uh, next thing you know, he goes he goes down to, uh, he leaves here, goes to Brother Joey's. And I told Brother Joey, I said, down at the pastor at Wagner, down there in Calvary, I said, Brother Joey, I said, that man is dangerous. You need to watch him. He said, oh, Brother Townsend. I said, okay. So Brother Joey's first wife was uh, ill. She's in the hospital. She's dying. This guy took him for about three or four grand while she's in the hospital. And so next time I saw him, I said, hey, Brother Joey, how you doing? How's Frank? Somebody needs to tell somebody about that man. <laughs> I said, uh, Brother Joey, I did try to tell you. He says, but what do you do about the verse that says, speak evil of no man? Oh my goodness. And I said, Brother Joey, is the truth evil? And he thought a minute and he says, you know, you have to be careful. You can take a verse like that and say, hey, would you not warn another brother or sister of danger? Yeah, we should. We should tell about it. Amen? Uh, unless it's me, keep it quiet. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and uh, anyway, he had a change of mind on that verse. And that's why I brought it up. You know, sometimes we can take a, one verse in the scripture, and if you don't rightly divide it, 
like I was talking to somebody the other night about uh, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and Adam being the first man. All right. But if you don't rightly divide it, see, Lucifer was called also a man. And that's where the original sin started. But when God recreated and he placed him in the garden, then it was Adam that willfully and knowingly took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because his wife had disobeyed and he didn't want to lose his wife and he acted as a type of Christ and given himself for her. Amen. So be careful in the scripture. Sometimes if you don't rightly divide it and put it where it belongs, you can get all tangled out up. Uh, you remember the scripture, Judas went out and hung himself and the other verse that says, go do you likewise. <laughs> Amen. So be careful. Verse three, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our savior toward man appeared. Now look at verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. You see that? Not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, the prefix re on renewing. When did you ever have the Holy Ghost? You've heard me preach this over and over. You had it in the garden in Adam. <laughs> You lost it when Adam fell. Amen. But he says, and regeneration. Regeneration. Back in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, and the likeness of God made he him. Then we go over to Matthew, and you've got the generation of Jesus Christ. And, and in, in the book of Luke. Amen. And then we have the regeneration. Why? Man failed. Man failed. Man was lost and undone. Man has a sinful and wicked nature. The Bible says we're all as an unclean thing. In uh, Genesis chapter 6, if you'd like, you can turn there. But a lot of people... They make a profession of faith, of salvation, and they start out fairly strong. They're excited about the things of God, doing things for God. Then they get down the road a little bit and life interferes. <laughs> Problems come up. Things begin to slip in your walk with the Lord. Right away, people think, well, did I really get saved or am I lost? That's a terrible state to be in, being unsure, because you're invaluable. You're not valuable to God because now you're not. I mean, I'm talking about in the sense of service because you don't have that zeal you once had to go tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ because you're unsure of yourself now. And people begin to stray away, and then they get into sin. One thing leads to another, and hopefully. They want to get back, but the one desire a person has that's been regenerated according to the scriptures and the word of God is that even though they stray inside here, there is a desire to be holy. There is a desire to get away from the filth of the world, even though the flesh loves it. Amen. The flesh loves it. This old body is dead in trespasses and sins. And that's why we need a new nature. That's why we need to be born again. And that's through regeneration. But this is what the Lord said. In verse 5 of chapter 6 of Genesis. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is what he says about your flesh. Amen. Amen. That it's evil continually. He says. The thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That every imagination and thoughts of his heart. That's the human nature. 
That has not changed. Every man born of Adam after the fall is the same way. Our thoughts, our imaginations of our heart, it all deals with our flesh. Can you turn the heat down? Anybody else hot? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. But in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, the key words there are every, only, and continually. We begin to judge ourselves when we fail God, and, and we judge ourselves according to feeling, to feelings. Rather than from the teaching of the word of God. Do we search the scriptures? Do we look through them to see what the scriptures have to say? How much time do you spend in the Bible? Many think that regeneration is changing the old nature. You can't change this old nature. Amen. Amen. It's dead, it's vile, it's wicked, it's wretched. And if you don't bath often, it's picture. <laughs> There's nothing good about it. The sad thing is, That sad thing is that we sometimes as preachers preach a change in the old nature as proof of salvation, of works, amen, by the Holy Ghost, which is true. And the Holy Ghost does teach us to live godly. But when you try to relate it to things you've done and not done, like, for instance, uh, all right, if you're really saved, you wouldn't be thinking that way or you wouldn't be doing this or you wouldn't be doing that. So you got to quit thinking this way, doing this, doing that. And then you're going to be all right with God. Well, that's works. I like the sign on Highway 302 at that little church, little tiny building up there. And it says, the law says do. Jesus says done. Mm -hmm. Amen. But that does not give us a license to go out and live worldly and wickedly or anything else. Right. There ought to be desire within to please God. Everything we do, we need to run by him in prayer. Wait on an answer. We don't always do that. I'm a prime example of that. I've been a mess of a lot of things, amen. You can say amen, it won't hurt my feelings. Amen. And so, we look at the change in the old nature and think that that salvation is not the case. But there ought to be a change in our lifestyle, not the old nature. I hear something. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 14. I've got some verses here I'd like to run through. Now, I've struggled with doubts in my life as a Christian. I struggled with, hey, am I really saved? And, you know, at the time, my desires had changed. When I was religious and lost, I could go sit in the bar and out there in Dallas, Texas with the other, other guys. And I could listen to the music and the dancing and all and talk to my buddies and drink Coca-Colas. And like I said before, many times they would say, come on, Frank, have a drink. And somebody else would say, no, Frank, I got religion. And they were right. That's what I got, religion. But when I truly got saved, three years later, I didn't want to be around that crowd anymore. 
Amen. Things changed. Uh, I wanted to go to church, which I never did before. <laughs> I'd go once in a while when my conscience bothered me, but I never really wanted to go. Pretty soon now I'm running to, I mean, we drive 100 miles to a meeting. Amen. We'd go listen to preachers and, and we were fellowshipping with the Lord and with other saints and passing out tracts and witnessing. And then this doubt came in. Are you sure you're saved? What that did was just stop me in my tracks, slowed me down. How could I tell anybody else about the Lord Jesus Christ if I didn't know that I was in him? And I struggled with that. And I went out and one time beside the church, I got down on my knees and I prayed and asked God to save me and told people I got saved. And, and this little voice, how could you get saved again? I went back and I studied the scripture and I says, well, people say, if you doubt, you're damned. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin and you're lost if you doubt. See, what was I going by? What people had to say, not what scripture had to say. And so I said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to preach and I'm going to witness and I'm going to pass out tracts. And if I'm lost, I'm going to do it on my way to hell. And you know what happened? That went away. But then as you get older, you think things are supposed to get better. But you realize that this sin nature <clears throat> is going to try to tear you down all the way to the grave. Amen. Do you know that you'll get out there and. You'll think some bad thoughts. I told people before when I first got saved, I'd be on my knees praying and I'd be having a good time with the Lord. And all of a sudden, the most ungodliest thoughts I ever had in my life started running through my head. I never even thought of when I was lost. Never even thought of. What was that? Well, I found out later it's called the fiery darts of the wicked over in Ephesians chapter six. Trying to get you away from the Lord when that didn't work. You'd be on your knees spending time with the Lord. And all of a sudden, you'd remember a hundred things that you needed to do that you forgot to do. That's to get you away from the prayer, talking to God, because that's where your strength is. You talk to him, he talks to you through the word of God. So regeneration is not making this old flesh new. It's dead. It's gone. It's going to the grave. Amen. It's going to rot. We're maggot food. Just think, one day the worm's going to be crawling in and out of you. I couldn't be a mortician. I got a cousin that is, but I couldn't be. But in Psalm, in chapter 14, in verse 2, it says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. We well, you know Paul says in Romans that no man seeketh after God. God seeks us. And he says he did it through the preaching of the word of God. Amen. He says in verse 3, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, three key words there in those verses. All. None. And no, not one. You see, there's no hope there for that flesh and for mankind at all in that verse. Amen. He said, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And he said, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Then in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in chapter 1. This is probably going to be a two or three part message. Isaiah chapter one, beginning in verse five. The prophet says, why should you be stricken anymore? He said, you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. 
and the whole heart faint from the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been closed neither bound up neither mollified with ointment key words there the whole head is sick the whole heart is faint amen so that's not saying a whole lot about humankind is it Isaiah chapter 40 He says in verse 6, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? He said, all flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. He said, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So he says, all flesh is as grass. You ever seen grass come up and on a, a stony surface, you know, on a rock or something? You got a little bit of sand or gravel, a little sprout of grass grows up. It's dead in a moment. Amen. He said that's what man is. And then Jeremiah 17, 9, a very familiar verse. Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Amen. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So he says, the heart is deceitful above all things. You mean more deceitful than the devil itself? That's what it says. The heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart will lie to you. I've used many illustrations, and one of the greatest ones that plagued me every day is I was looking for checks the other day. <laughs> I searched my truck. I searched the glove box. I searched the cabinets, any place where I would have put something. I searched the office. I'm laying in bed. And I'm saying, I know I put them there. And all of a sudden, I couldn't sleep. I jumped up. Oh, I said, what are you doing? I walked on over to the, my cabinet, grabbed my wallet off the top, reached down in where I kept my driver's license, and there were the checks. But I just knew I had put them over here or left them there. <coughs> How many times have you... Put, lost your keys or you put your keys somewhere and in your mind you said I know I put them here I know it just to find out that that's not where you put them you see your heart's deceitful I know in my heart that's where I put them who took them you see your heart is deceitful it will deceive you now I think that's enough verses in the Old Testament to suffice that there's nothing good about us. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to look at some in the New Testament. Look at John. The Gospel of John in chapter 2. John in chapter 2. In verses 24 and 25. I don't have a verse 25 in chapter 2. I do. Yeah, we do. Are you in first, John? No, where did I go? <laughs> Look, Lord, help me. Oh. Don't blame your doors. I couldn't see the 25. I said, I know. I read it. I put it down. I got a note. Of course, I had done that before, put down a, a verse that I read and I miswrote the verse and I get there and I'm looking for it. I know I put it there. <laughs> verse 24 and 25. 
But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Amen. He knows what's in man. What did Paul say in Romans in chapter 7? For I know that in me, and then in parentheses he puts, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He put it in parentheses because if he said that I know that in me dwelleth no good thing, then that would mean that Jesus wasn't any good either. Amen. And that's why the King James Bible put the parentheses there. Amen. To differentiate between the spirit and the flesh. And he said, for I know that is in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So we saw that from the Old Testament, that there's no good thing. And then in John chapter 3, in verse 6, it says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Amen. So that's why he said, you must be born again. He said, a man cannot see the kingdom of God except to be born again. He's got to be born again to see it. He said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, but is within you. And people cannot see it. And that's why the lost world, the unbelievers, cannot get a grip on this. They can't see. Why? Cometh not with observation. The spirit borns that into you. And all you have to do is be willing to believe what the scripture says about it. And he'll save you. You doubt the scripture, you'll never get anywhere. As long as you're doubting the scripture. As long as you're looking for an argument to prove the scripture wrong. <clears throat> First John 1 John 1.8 says that if we say we have no sin, his word is not in us. Right? So he's talking to saved people, correct? <clears throat> First John 3.9 says, He that is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. And so what people like uh, C.I. Schofield and their notes put man cannot continually practice sin because they don't get the spiritual application to it. <clears throat> or does not continually commit sin. No, the Bible said, he that is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. First John 1 John 1.8 says, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and his word is not in us. So we either have an apparent contradiction in the Bible where somebody doesn't understand the spiritual aspect of it. All right? This old flesh is here. It's going to sin. That's why he gave us 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's he talking about in 1 John 3, 9? He that is born of God does not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin. Well, he's talking about the new man. It's Christ in you. The new nature. It cannot sin because it's born of God. My favorite illustration, most of you have heard it over and over, is the egg. It's got a shell, a white, and a yolk. The chicken can plop it out down there. You can roll it in the cow dung. has an effect the yolk in one bit, one bit. That's a picture of the new man in Christ that cannot sin because it's born of God. You see, when people don't understand something, they try to make it fit what they think they believe. That's why they changed the Bible. That's why the King James translator said one more exact translation. It wasn't just one man. It was 50 some men from Oxford and Cambridge and Westminster, different denominations. And they put the King James Bible together. And you know what? They didn't have no one shot. They tried to, the Catholics tried to blow them up. Guy Fawkes tried to blow them up in 1604. But that failed. Why? He was a Roman Catholic Jesuit. And the Catholics did not want the common man to be able to read and understand the Bible because then they couldn't hold their superstition over them. Today, that's your Hebrew and Greek scholars. They want you to go to them and say, unless you understand the Hebrew and the Greek, you, know, you really don't have a good understanding. They're a bunch of liars. They don't even read Hebrew and Greek. 
real Hebrew and Greek. Amen. I can go to a Strong's Concordance and go back to the Hebrew and Greek dictionary in the back, take the number from the word that's over here, look up the word back there, take that number, get the definition, and tell you it says, I already come up with, you know, whatever. <laughs> Sound like a Pentecostal in heat, speaking in tongues. <laughs> Amen. Let's look over, if you would, to Romans chapter 3. Romans in chapter 3. And we're just looking at what the Scripture has to say about man. Old Testament, New Testament. Amen? What the Lord thinks of the, the natural man, that old wicked flesh. Romans in chapter 3, and I'm going to begin in verse 9. It says, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Not you, not me, not my mama, not my grandmama. Amen. None. Man is totally depraved according to these scriptures. Their throat is an open sepulcher. That's a grave. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's why it ought not to be in the mouth of a professing Christian. Amen. Amen. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Who's under the law? All them that are born of Adam. Amen. You see, man through the law could not attain unto the righteousness of God. The law was a schoolmaster. David in the Old Testament knew that the law wasn't going to do it. That's why he was able to set up the Ark of the Covenant in his pitched a tent for it. It's called the Tabernacle of David and sat down before it, not being of the priesthood and could worship God because he knew it wasn't under the law. Amen. The law never made anyone perfect. The law was to show us our imperfections, to show us that we're lost, that we're wicked, that we're godless without Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 8. He says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So even if you could keep all the commandments, it still wouldn't do you any good. Paul said, as touching the law, he was blameless. Until he said, thou shalt not covet. So you can go out there and try to keep all the commandments, and it's not just ten. There's 614 of do's and don'ts in the law under Levitical priesthood. And you can go out there and keep every one of them, you'd still die and go to hell. Because the law never made anybody perfect. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll look at uh, verse 12. Paul says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens. You believe in aliens? <laughs> I believe in aliens. We've all been aliens. <laughs> at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Amen. So we were without hope, no hope. Without God in the world. 
Isn't it a shame all these young people out here today that, you know, a lot of them don't, don't even know who Jesus is? Their generation has failed them. Our generation has failed them. So I got written here, the scriptures attest to the fact that man is lost, guilty, alienated, without strength, evil, evil continually. All said, how then can we ever be changed or improved? Jeremiah chapter 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23. Says this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Michael Jackson tried to. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can a leopard change his spots? No. But neither can we do good that are accustomed to evil. And then back in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He says, Oh, let's see. Where do I want to go here? Let me start in verse 1. No, I'm not going to read down through there. Let's just go to verse 15. He says, That which is crooked cannot be made straight. That which is wanting cannot be numbered. That which is crooked, crooked cannot be made straight. So as we see from the Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, what's it say about man? He's dead and trespasses in sin. He's evil. The thoughts and intents of his heart are only evil continually. Look at the businesses out there that cater to the filth of this world. They sit around and think about what they could sell to somebody to defile themselves. Now we're going to have a Bible drill and I'll be done. <coughs> John chapter 20. Let me ask you something while you're turning there. So according to that scripture, is there anything that you can do to get to heaven? Is there anything that you can change in your life to get you to heaven? Anybody got an answer? From the scriptures that we read in the Old Testament and New Testament this morning. About what it says about our nature and about what we are. Is there anything that we can do? That's going to get us justified before God? The answer is no. There's nothing we can do. In John chapter 20. In verse 31. He says... But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. Amen. Not through your good works, not through your deeds, not through your feelings. I said this the last week or so. I said when I first had my great religious experience three years before I got saved. I was on the side of the road praying. Pulled the 18-wheeler over on the side, got out, threw my belt buckle away, got my so-called, you've heard the Living Bible last week. Remember when Petra read it for us? <laughs> and uh, I got that piece of garbage out, and I got down and asked Jesus to come into my heart. Oh, man, the feeling was tremendous. I mean, I cannot explain to you today how it really felt. Just like something was just totally lifted off. I had told the Lord coming down the road, I said, I can't run my life. I'm about to lose my family. 
I'm about to lose my home, my business. I said, I cannot control myself. I need somebody to control me. And I knew that was Jesus. I had that much sense. And I prayed that prayer, and it's like a ton of weight come off me. The old devil slipped me a phony. Man, I got home excited, joined the Southern Baptist Church over in Springdale. I was in there teaching Sunday school, sticking up for the fornicating, whoremonging preacher. Amen. And for three years, I sat there lost. If I went to church on Sunday, forget Sunday school. If I just showed up for church, I was doing God a favor. He owed me. <laughs> if I came Wednesday, man, I better get a double blessing. But then a neighbor needed a pair of jumper cables. One thing led to another, and I ended up at Gethsemane Anabaptist Church and heard real preaching. And I got to argue with my pastor about the word faith in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he asked me whose faith that was, and I said mine. He said, no, it's Christ's faith. I said, no, it's mine. And, of course, we argued over that for months. Miss Randall can attest to it. We come out of Kroger's grocery store. I seen him going across the parking lot, and I said, it's my faith. He said, let the ignorant be ignorant. <laughs> so then I was invited on a missionary trip to the islands, and I went, and on the way back, the preacher preached at me, and I found out it was Christ's faith and not mine. Amen. I got under Holy Ghost conviction. Amen. My faith wouldn't get me anywhere. I mean, it says if I had the faith of a mustard seed, I could remove mountains. I haven't moved any mountains. Christ did. <laughs> Again, but these are the written. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and that believing you might have life through his name. Acts chapter 13. In verse 39. He says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Romans in chapter 6. Beginning in verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, and as Pastor Randall once thought, it was not his father. Amen. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when a person gets regenerated and gets born again by simply believing on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then he's to reckon his flesh dead and alive unto Christ, alive unto God. And he's to strive to serve him in newness of life. Amen. But what if you don't? What if you mess up? Well, you wrote 1 John 1, 9 so you could confess it and get on with your life. But if you can go out there and live in your sin and have no desire for holiness, then there's something wrong with your profession. 
You see, a lot of people can believe with the head instead of the heart. And they miss heaven by that far. I always believed that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I never understood that he is God. But I did believe that Jesus died on the cross. And I believed that if you did good, you went to heaven. If you did bad, you went to hell. So I believed in the heaven and I believed in the hell. But I had some mixed up doctrine. It wasn't until the scripture showed me what I was. And that I couldn't do anything about it except receive the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. That's what changed me. How do you believe today? Do you believe with the head? Or do you believe with the heart? Where's your heart at? Now you know the scripture said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But it does give us a new heart in Christ. The spirit of God comes to live with us. When we do wrong, does it grieve the spirit of God? Some people, you know, Brother James pulled a verse out today in Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 2 about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. It's in you. Work it out. Amen? Get it out there. Let people see it. Live it. Let the word of God become your final authority. This is all you've got to live by. Anything we know about heaven or hell or God or the devil or salvation comes from a book but not just any book it comes from the word of God Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 and you hath he quickened that word quickened means made alive you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that you're already seated in the heavenlies if you've been born again? Amen. You've got a glorified body already seated in the heavenlies. Sitting there waiting on you. That's why... The form of Armenian doctrine, I mean, and you can get it and then lose it and get it back and lose it. Amen. When uh, I believed that, I kept thinking, I, I look back at it now and I say, yeah, that's great. I'm already seated in heavenly places, so I mess up, I lose it, and he throws me out. Then I get it back and he sets me back up. I'll tell you what, that body's going to be wore out before I get there. But it doesn't work that way. We're seated in heavenly places and we're sealed into the day of redemption by that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 13. He said, Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's that egg yolk. Amen. The inner man, the new man that cannot sin, that's born of God, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Then Colossians in chapter 2. Colossians in chapter 2. 
beginning in verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them op openly, triumphing over them in it. So the work was Christ. He's the one that did the suffering. Amen. He's the one that died, descended into hell, suffered, and rose again so that we could be made the sons of God through the shedding of his blood and the forgiveness of sins. There is nothing in the scripture that we read today in the Old Testament and the New that can justify your flesh outside of Jesus Christ. And he done gave up on it. He didn't, he, he didn't try to make it new. He just made a new man in it. And that's the mystery of godliness. Christ in us. Amen. That's the mystery. And if Christ is in us, he's going to give us the desires that he has. A desire for holiness. Does that mean that we're going to be perfect? No. We have a, still have this sin nature. But you're going to follow the dictates of the one that you're following. Are you in the scripture? Are you seeking to please him? Or are you just walking in the flesh? Do you read your Bible every day? Do you try to obey it as Brother Dale said? In obeying the scriptures in the New Testament? That's related to us? Or do we just pick and choose what we want to do? Galatians chapter 5. Now I'll be like ja uh, Megan's hash this morning. Done. He says in verse 25 of Galatians, or verse 24 of Galatians 5, he says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. Do you think it's easy to walk in the Spirit all the time? No. The Bible says, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. How much suffering do you do in the flesh? When your flesh says, you want this or you want that, as you <coughs> can see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of control <laughs> on some things. And... Uh, Matter of fact, I have an expert here with us today about the lack of control over things chocolate and cold and gooey. Hey, Ben. She'd rather eat a whole fudge cake for breakfast than an egg. We all have our issues, hey, Ben. God's made a way for us to overcome them if we desire. That's walking in the Spirit. It's just simply obeying the Scripture. So what is salvation? It's nothing you can do. Old Testament, New Testament, attested to that this morning, that there's nothing good about this old flesh. 
that the only hope you have is believing that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And you're going to have to have a continual daily walk with him if you want to please him. Now, if you're saved, and you know you are, but yet you're not right, you need to get it right, because the Bible says, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that we may give an account of the deeds, whether it be good or bad, in our body. The deeds that we've done in our body. See, Christians do go to a judgment. Some of these new Bibles change Romans chapter 8 from condemnation to judgment where it says there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. They'll change it to there's no judgment. That's not true. It would deny other scripture. It would contradict other scripture. You see, Jesus said he came not into the world to what? Condemn the world, but that the world through Christ might be saved. The only ones under condemnation are the ones that haven't received Jesus Christ. You're already under the condemnation of the law and the judgment of the law. In Hebrews 9.27 it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So all are going to a judgment. If you're lost or you make it through the tribulation lost, you're going to the white throne judgment of God the Father. If you're saved, you're going to the judgment seat of Christ. So why should we live holy? Oh, you're saved by the work of Christ. You trusted him. That means I can do whatever I want now, right? No. There's also called the sin and the death of the believer. That means you can get so far out there, the Lord says, all right, I'm just going to bring you home. And you'll give an account for it at the judgment seat of Christ. So where are you at today? Are you saved or are you lost? Are you walking in the spirit? You're walking in the flesh. Where do you want to be? Salvation is simple. It's believing in the finished work of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Believing in him and on him and through him. That salvation is so simple. And if we are saved, we're going to want to produce works to please him. We're going to want to further the kingdom. We're going to have a desire to see people saved because we don't want to see our friends going to hell. We don't want to see our families going to hell. So that ought to entice us to live right so that they can see Christ in us. You ever heard people say that at one time, you know, they're living for God. They're doing what's right. And people would watch him and somebody would come to him and say, I thought I was saved, but I don't have what you have. Or I wish I had what you had. It's because they saw something different in you. Parents today are destroying their own children. They've got their own idea of what religion is. Instead of what the scripture has to say. The Lord said we're to be faithful. Faithful to all things in Christ. Could anybody build any kind of organization on your faithfulness? Let alone a church. Church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Said. Amen. It's your choice, heaven or hell. It's your choice. Amen. Amen. And it's your choice how you're going to fare at the judgment seat of Christ. What kind of crowns will you receive? What's going to burn up wood, hay, and stubble? What's going to survive the fire? Gold, silver, and precious stone. Amen? All right. I'm like a Pillsbury biscuit. I'm done. Or is it good? 
Brother Dave, if you would, dismiss us. Amen. Appreciate everybody being here today. Lord, we're going to say the Lord again. We do thank you for this day, Lord God. We do thank you for what we heard here at the preaching hour, Lord, and at the regeneration, Lord God. And Father, there's no other way for us to uh, to be regenerated except through you and your precious blood, what you've done for us in Calvary, Lord God. <laughs> Father, I do pray if any here or uh, that are listening on Facebook, Lord God, that Father, that if they want to be saved, Lord God, all they have to do is trust in you, believe in you, Lord, and let you uh, make the, you've already made the atonement, and all they have to do is accept it. Lord God, we do pray, Lord, that you look after each and every one of us, guide us, lead us, help us, Lord God, carry us on through until the next appointed time. And we thank you and praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Shake hands with everybody. You're not.